All right. It's a nice facility. Um, the folks who lease this space from this is a Clemmers um, Food Corporation. Clemmers. Clemmers. I have to say it's not Clemmers. That's moving company. <laughs> Clemmers Food Corporation is CFC. CFC Logistics is the building here, and this uh, office here is rented by a uh, business group that we're involved with. It's actually an Amway group. And our, our leader, um, when when I talked to him about you know the possibility of um, using this for a venue, was thrilled. He said, "We stand for everything you believe in, so we're absolutely love to have you here at uh, considerable savings to us." So that's really super. And Jerry doesn't have to wear things with pockets. We can actually uh, take donations. Uh, we can sell things, as as you can see in the back. So um, we're happy to be here. All right, we always start with um, the Pledge of Allegiance and prayer, so I've asked Art Trumbor if he would pray, so we'll all stand, and then we will pledge to the American. Maybe we should pray for Jamie, too, after they lost that tattoo. <laughs> I kind of had a thing like that, too. I have a totally blind friend who has who sold his house and has to be out by tomorrow. Oh, wow. And, uh, he asked me to come up and help him move his furniture today just as I saw that storm coming. Oh, but uh, praise the Lord, we got everything moved and covered with a tarp that didn't even get wet. So, oh. And he was praying. So let's pray. Father, Father God, we thank you so much that we have been placed at this time, at this place, in this wonderful country that was founded and built upon biblical principles by biblical Bible loving, Christ loving people. Thank you, Lord, that you have been with us opportunity to be involved in defending the Constitution that they wrote, defending the freedoms that they planned for us to have, and that you have blessed us so much with uh, the power of your Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now all we can say is thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the people that have come here tonight to support this organization. Jamie's organization, too, and she has organized the events for the evening. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be here to bless and give everyone uh, wisdom and understanding, especially the speakers who have come to make their presentations to us tonight. We pray that you will, you, know, you will be with them and give them wisdom to speak. We pray that these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. I wanted to um, start off by thanking some of our members who put some extra time into making um, our transition smooth. Jane Kissel, who is heading out the door and needs to turn around and wave, <laughs> was the one who made those wonderful arrows on the sign. Oh, yeah. So yeah. wasn't that a help? Nice. Uh, nice. A round of applause for Jane. <laughs> thank you so much. Bill here, Bill Jones, is our um, website guy, a uh, tech guy, and then Luke, um, both of these gentlemen had came in on their own time and made sure they knew how the equipment all worked, so uh, let's give them a round of applause as well. <laughs> Thank you to the setup crew, we appreciate that. <clears throat> um, there was a ping pong table in the middle of the floor when we got here, so, <laughs> so it definitely needed some setup work. Um, you know, if we, if we feel real energetic afterward, maybe we'll put it back up. Travel around, you know. <laughs> My boys love to come up here and play. Okay, um, just a couple things I wanted to mention real quick um, because some folks, if I know at least one of our couples has to leave early, on your way out, uh, just a caution when you go back down AM Drive, there is a stop sign where that road comes over at right angles and goes over to the turnpike. Please make sure you stop big trucks come down that road they do not have a stop okay headed for the turnpike so uh, watch that stop sign and then if you came from Quaker Town Way you don't want to continue on AM Drive because you cannot make a left at Barocco's Pizza you can only make a right so make a left at that stop sign okay down AM Drive there's a stop sign make a left and that dead ends you right behind the wall and then you go up that way okay what is the motel there uh, there's uh, spring something sweets or something. Yeah. Well, You're going behind those. Right. That's yeah. Goes yeah, it goes right behind them. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Um, what else? Um, oh, none of you are smokers, but I have to say there's no smoking on the property. So, um, just so you know that, in case you happen to invite somebody, actually they get like a thousand dollar fine if they, Whoa. if somebody that uses this facility smokes <coughs> on the property. So that's good. They're serious about it. Um, hey, wasn't that great news about Eric Cantor? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> might have sent just a little signal to the powers that be in Washington. So. Hopefully that rattled some cages and shocked some people and made them wake up. Um, I think whatever we can do from a distance to help get, is it Kevin? David. David, 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 David Brad. Brad. David Brad. Whatever we can do to uh, help him get elected in the fall, it's very important now that he uh, beat the Democrat, which you should be able to do. They're evidently both professors at the same college. And, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, both professors at the same college. And um, mm -hmm. it is a predominantly Republican area anyway. And obviously his message resounded, you know, with a whole lot more than Cantor's walking and uh, middle of the road. <laughs> so um, that was all by way of just little preliminary announcements. And I'm going to bring, bring Bill up here. He's just going to give you a quick virtual tour about the wonderful new website he set up and then we'll um, get into some of our issues. Um, the, um, the website, um, has every, everyone looked at the website? Yeah, yeah. great. That's good. Um, one of the things that I thought might be confusing is um, these tabs up here. Like everyone knows about the tabs. You go to the calendar. Um, uh, one of the things is um, if you put the cursor on something, it will uh, it will show a drop down, right? But if you click it, it uh, it should link to the to the external website, like of, of the comp of the group that's running the event. So if you click on that one. It goes to actually the PACC, <laughs> so that that wasn't too clear uh, for some people. That not only is there a drop down, but you can but you can click on it to get more information. Okay. And one of the things, like the sidebar here, contains a lot of information, like on every page. Um, and you can see, like here's a here's a list of, of the representatives. Most of the representatives around here. As well as you can find, uh, like you can find your representative for the U.S. House of Representatives website, and um, also there's um, there's something all the way down here. Here's like the um, here's a listing of the blog traffic, and this shows um, if you click on unique, it shows here within the last 30 days there was 912 people, 912 unique people that looked at the website. And, um, and also down here I put a country counter show, so it shows like um, which of the people that have visited come from all different countries. So you can see there's Brazil, Italy, France. There's actually like a Ukraine too. Yeah. Somewhere. You're like the IRS, you know everything about it. Uh, <laughs> no, just, just numbers. <laughs> And then um, when, on the tabs, when something opens up like this, like for home and then mission statement, each of those have, have a separate um, separate page. And here was the announcement I put up, like actually I think this morning, um, with the late breaking news. I put in there, keep fighting, don't give up. Because I know it's easy to give up. Uh, but when, when a tab opens up like this, if you click on mission statement, this comes up with like, well, the original page that was there with Jamie's contact information. So, so if you have something like this, issues and legislation are two different pages. So this is a list of, of kind of like the issues that we're involved with. And, um, the videos, I, I've been putting some videos on there, 
we, um, in the past it was videos just from our group, but I've, I've been putting on a few, uh, a few different ones from other groups. Candor's concession speech? <laughs> um, yeah, that's like, that's right here. I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't embed that video directly, but this link right here shows the Cantor concession speech. But I guess we don't really have time to look at it. No, so. we don't. Okay, now that, so. let's let's uh, point that out right there. That the uh, figure that you're seeing in that video is Dr. Kupesta. That is one of the best Common Core uh, videos that you can watch. It's excellent, and I'm sure they'll mention it tonight. We have a couple for sale. Yeah, we've got a couple for sale. Is that the one at It's yes, yeah, yes. There? The John Hunt oh, Society yeah. meeting at yeah. Yeah. And then. Um, and you had a mob that was attacking his office, Cancer's office. I think the video on there. Uh, okay. I think he, I think it was on there. Really? The immigration mob. They went and stormed his office. So oh, really? Yeah. I forget where I saw it. I mean, maybe you might see it on MSNBC tonight. I'm joking. <laughs> I put an economics tab on here because it kind of like discusses a little bit about the Federal Reserve and banking and how how our money supply is being manipulated. And then actually here here was a good article I, I put in that uh, has it shows the stock market valued in gold. And actually it hit a high in 1999 and it's still not back to where it was at that point. And that's about it, I guess. Um, does anybody have any questions that, when they were looking at the website and was confused about anything? Not at all. I thought it was very good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Terrific. Yes. So now the guest, the next thing I have to do is play the video, play the DVD, right? Yes. <laughs> so the next thing on our agenda tonight um, is um, one in a series that we're picking back up. Um, everybody has the outline. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's an outline with questions there, and it's just sort of a, a guideline that you can follow if you wish to or take home with you um, as a review. But this is um, the Constitutional Literacy Series by Michael Ferris. Are you all familiar with Michael Ferris? Yes. Homeschool Legal Defense Association, one of the top constitutional lawyers. So this is about a 20 minute video and we are going to play that now. And by the way, um, uh, this is something that we'll be discussing on the board at our meeting tomorrow, but um, I was thinking that we would probably take the first, uh, or possibly take the first uh, half hour for this video every meeting and then start the meeting proper if we have speakers or whatever at 7, go 7 to 9. So some folks are a little hard pressed to get here at 6.30 and we don't want to leave out the uh, education on the Constitution since that is why we're here. The Constitution contains a very short list of the duties and powers of the President. The President is the Commander-in-Chief over our military. He may require each of his Cabinet officers to give him their opinions in writing on the performance of their duties. He may grant pardons, but not in the case of impeachment. He can make treaties, but only with the advice and consent of the Senate. He has the power of appointment for senior officers and judges, again with the advice and consent of the Senate. He has the duty to deliver a message on the State of the Union. He has the power to recommend measures for Congress to enact. He can call special sessions of Congress. 
He resolved disputes between the two houses as to the time of adjournment. He received ambassadors, and he shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And he gives all officers of the United States, including military officers, their commissions. There was very little controversy about any of these listed powers. Almost all of the controversies arise when the president acts outside of these explicitly enumerated powers. Here are some of the major questions we face today about presidential power. First, can the president send our troops to war without a declaration of war by Congress? Second, can the president and the executive agencies, which he controls, make executive orders and administrative regulations that have the force and effect of law? Third, can the president enter into some kinds of treaties without the consent of the Senate? Each of these questions have a direct answer in the Constitution which should leave no room for doubt. Article 1, Section 8 gives Congress the exclusive power to declare war. Article 1, Section 1 says that all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in the Congress of the United States. And Article 2, Section 2 expressly declares that the President's power to make treaties is conditioned on the proviso that two-thirds of the senators present concur. Despite these clear rules, our current practices are an obvious violation of the Constitution. There were 53,686 Americans killed in the Korean War. 58,209 were killed in Vietnam. 1,505 Americans have been killed in Afghanistan. And in the current war in Iraq, 4,439 Americans have been killed. Over 100,000 Americans killed in wars where Congress has never declared war. In fact, we've never declared war since World War II. Our nation is not in compliance with the Constitution when it comes to the entrance into war. Our nation is simply flooded with executive orders issued by the President and by the federal regulations issued by the horde of agencies that are under his control. On March 8, 2011, President Obama issued Executive Order 13,568, which is the running number of executive orders issued by all presidents. All federal regulations are found in a series of books called the Code of Federal Regulations. There are approximately 200 books of administrative laws in this collection of federal regulations. That's 200 books of laws, none of which have ever been passed by Congress. It has become the practice of all presidents since World War II to prefer the practice of entering into treaties without ever seeking the advice and consent of the Senate. Our State Department calls these treaties executive agreements, a term that has no meaning in international law. Every single executive agreement is considered a treaty in international law, regardless of what the State Department or White House chooses to call it. The United States is currently a party to over 900 treaties that have been properly ratified by the United States Senate. But we are also parties to over 5,000 treaties that have not been ratified. But our White House and State Department deems them to be binding by the trick of simply labeling them executive agreements. We should not be so partisan in our thinking to conclude that presidents from only one political party are responsible for all this. Both parties are presidents that have created all of these kinds of constitutional violations. Nor should we think that the White House is taking power away from the unwilling Congress. Congress is fully on board with this transfer of this legislative power to the White House. Why would Congress go along with this? It's a simple reason, but when you learn the truth, it's very disturbing. Let's take an example. Congress passes a law declaring that it wants the nation to pursue a policy of clean air. <coughs> the devil is in the details of these things, so Congress just creates broad principles and rules in such environmental laws and leaves all of the details in the hands of the Environmental Protection Agency. The EPA makes the detailed rules that all farmers and businesses must obey. If the EPA makes a rule that defies common sense and is really onerous, then no member of Congress can be held politically responsible. Congressmen didn't go any specific rule question so they can deflect all political responsibility away from themselves. They can even claim, I wrote a stern letter of concern to the EPA protesting this very rule. The stern letters of concern are of no consequence to the EPA. They provide no protection to the business owner 
who must comply with these difficult and burdensome rules. Congress gets all the glory for protecting clean air and none of the political responsibility for the detailed, burdensome, overreaching rules created by the Environmental Protection Agency. This is a powerful political gimmick that robs us of the democratic process because the voters cannot vote out the EPA and Congress avoids all responsibility. It is a powerful political gimmick. The same thing is true about war. Congress doesn't want the responsibility of voting to enter a war. If Congress declares war, then it is a decision by the nation. And each member of Congress will face the voters on the issue of the appropriateness of the decision. But if we enter a war solely on the decision of the president, then Congress can support the war when it's going well, and then criticize the war if it's dragging on too long or starts going badly. When they don't vote for it, they avoid political responsibility. This Bush's war or Obama's war. It's not the way of Congress, nor the way of the nation. If Congress won't force the president to obey the Constitution, then what the Supreme Court? Aren't they supposed to make sure that the Constitution is always obeyed? The Supreme Court has steadfastly refused to even hear a case that contains a straightforward challenge to the actions by various presidents in waging war without a formal declaration of Congress. Numerous cases were filed challenging the constitutionality of the Vietnam War, and others were filed about the current war in Iraq. There have been decisions by various United States Courts of Appeal, which are one step below the Supreme Court in the federal system. But the Supreme Court has refused to hear any appeal from any of these decisions. Doe versus Bush, a case decided by the First Circuit in 2003, which decided a challenge to the current war in Iraq, is illustrative of the approach taken by the federal courts. In this case, the court noted that although Congress had not declared war, it had voted to pass a measure called the Authorization for the Use of Military Force, which made it clear that Congress and the President were not currently at odds over the pursuit of the war against Iraq. The court noted that a prior case challenging the Vietnam War was also dismissed because Congress had repeatedly voted to fund the war despite the fact that it was not declared war as required by the Constitution. Just as had been done in the Vietnam case, the appellate court held that until Congress and the President were truly at odds over the propriety for the war, it was not within the court's jurisdiction to declare that the war was unconstitutional. The problem with this approach is that it treats the war issue as if it was a battle only between Congress and the President. It leaves the people entirely out. The Doe versus Bush case was brought by military personnel and the families who were being assigned to in Iraq. The federal courts ruled they had no stand, they had no stake in the controversy that justified a court ruling on their behalf. The court said they would only intervene if there was a true standoff between Congress and the president. The court seeks to avoid these kinds of cases because of a legal theory called the political question doctrine. It's unseemly, the courts have said, for the judiciary to insert itself into the middle of a political dispute. It should show respect for the coordinate branches of government by staying out of these kinds of questions. Think about this for a minute. Which is more of a political question? People who are assigned to go fight or die ask the courts to determine if it's lawful to send them to war when Congress has not declared war? Or Congress and the President disagree about whether a particular conflict is proper, and this dispute ends up in court. In the first case, there's a pure question of law at stake. Does the Constitution require a declaration of war? In the second case, the conflict between Congress and the President is not going to be about the power of the President to enter into a war unilaterally. It's going to arise because Congress and the President are in conflict about a particular war and whether that war is a good idea. That is not a legal issue, but a pure political issue. The federal courts should do the exact opposite of what's been done. They should stay out of any dispute between Congress and the President over the wisdom of a particular war. But they should decide whether the Constitution permits one man, the President of the United States, to send Americans off to war without compliance with the requirements of the Constitution. Now, of course, Congress could impeach a President for high crimes and misdemeanors for sending Americans to war without a declaration. But that would take a courageous Congress, and we're woefully short of those. 
Now we're going to turn to the issue of whether the president can be given the legislative authority to pass laws despite the fact that the Constitution says all power for legislation lies to Congress. Keep in mind that for constitutional purposes, there is no difference between a direct presidential action and that of one of his agencies, like the Environmental Protection Agency, insofar as it comes to the power to make administrative rules that bind private parties. The most important decision about presidential power to make executive orders was made by the Supreme Court in 1952 in the case of Youngstown Sheet and Tube versus Sawyer. In this case, the steel unions were threatening to go on strike in the middle of the Korean War. In order to stop the strike, President Truman ordered the Secretary of Commerce to seize the steel mills to keep them operating. The steel mills challenged the constitutionality of the seizure order, raising several claims. But only one issue was decided by the Supreme Court. The President had no authority to issue the order, the court concluded. President Truman raised several arguments. First, he claimed the power to seize the mills because he was the commander-in-chief, and this was necessary for the war effort. The court rejected this argument, saying that the mills in the industrial belt of the country were not in the theater of the war, and his military power could not be stretched that far. Then, he argued that he could do this because it was a national emergency. The court answered, the Constitution was written for good times and bad times, and even in emergencies, his actions had to be authorized either by the Constitution or by an act of Congress. Neither was present here. Finally, he argued that since he was the chief executive officer of the nation, he had the ability to seize the mills as the sum of his total authority. To this, the court answered, the duty of the president is to enforce the laws and not create his own laws. The executive order was unauthorized and thus was unconstitutional. This decision was absolutely correct. It holds that the legislative power, the power to make laws, lies exclusively in the Congress and not in the executive branch. That was 1952. An earlier decision made a bit of an exception for matters falling within the foreign policy powers of the president. In 1936, the Curtis Wright Company was prosecuted by the federal government for shipping weapons to Bolivia in violation of a ban on such shipments, which had been ordered by President Franklin Roosevelt. It's very important to note that the president had been given authority to issue such a ban by Congress. But the act of Congress gave the president a good deal of discretion as to when the ban should be imposed and when it should be lifted. The claim by the Curtis Wright Company was that the law gave the president so much discretion that Congress had effectively delegated away its legislative power. Both sides conceded that it would be a violation of the Constitution for Congress to delegate its legislative powers to the president. However, the government contended that this particular delegation did not cross the line by giving the president too much discretion. The Supreme Court noted that if this much discretion to make orders and rules had been given to the president in the domestic context, it would have been an unconstitutional delegation of legislative power. But since this was in the area of foreign policy, and since it was important for the nation to speak with one voice, and since Congress had clearly authorized the president to take this action, the court held that this particular rulemaking did not cross the line. It was not a delegation of legislative authority, it was merely administrative implementation. Youngstown, which was decided in 1952, dealt with the situation where Congress had not authorized the executive branch to act. Thus, there was a significant difference in the case between Youngstown and Curtis Wright. Eight years before Youngstown, the Supreme Court had begun the process of expanding the rule of Curtis Wright into the domestic area. In the 1944 decision of Yankees versus the United States, the court dealt with a challenge to another of FDR's socialistic laws. This case challenged the delegation of power from Congress to an administrative official called the Price Administrator, who was given the power to control prices of various goods and commodities. The Act of Congress gave the Price Administrator a set of guidelines that he was to employ in his decisions concerning prices. A company that was criminally prosecuted for selling goods in violation of the maximum price set by the Price Administrator challenged the constitutionality of the entire scheme. The key argument was whether Congress had improperly delegated its legislative power to the Price Administrator. The court held, the standards prescribed by the present act with the aid of the statement of considerations required to be made by the administrator are sufficiently definite and precise to enable Congress, the courts, and the public to ascertain whether the administrator in fixing the designated prices has conformed to those standards. Hence, we are unable to find in them an unauthorized delegation of legislative power. In a sense, this is what I call the do the math power given to federal regulators. 
the Congress passes a very clear law with clear standards and directions, and the administrator has no more authority than, say, a clerk in following directions, then it's not an improper delegation of legislative power. But in reality, if you look at the powers given to the price administrator in this case, you would find that his powers were greater than what the court let on. Moreover, the whole scheme of the government regulating prices was beyond the Commerce Clause power. So there were clear constitutional violations in this case that weren't addressed. But the theory adopted by the court about doing the math, about that kind of regulation, that didn't go too far. If we stopped there, it wouldn't be too bad. All modesty was cast aside in the intervening years. In a 1984 case, we see the modern rule on the power to make administrative law. An environmentalist group, the National Resources Defense Council, sued Chevron Oil Company to challenge a rule made by the Environmental Protection Agency during the Reagan years. The EPA under Reagan had issued a new set of rules that said that the Clean Air Act standards for plants like the one run by Chevron were to be judged as a whole if the emissions for the entire plant were less than the standards set by law then the plant is in compliance with the law. This reversed a prior rule that said that every component of the plant had to meet the clean air standard. If there were two smokestacks and one emitted a lot of pollutants but the second emitted none, it was not the total pollution that mattered. But under the old rule, each and every smokestack had to be in compliance with the air quality standard. The environmental group wanted the courts to issue new regulations that were consistent with the prior rules. The EPA argued that it had the power to interpret the rules as it saw fit, and it believed that it was best to judge the clean air standards by looking at the total operations. There was a third alternative that neither side argued. It could have been, and should have been argued, that Congress was the only body which could establish its rules. The law failed to clarify which rule was proper, the entire factory rule or the individual smokestack rule. And this was no ministerial matter. The EPA was not just doing the math. It was acting with legislative discretion. Well, the court rejected the claims of the environmental organizations that the court should write the administrative rules. But it allowed the Environmental Protection Agency to write very substantial rules despite the fact that Congress had given it no standards at all. The net rule coming from the case was this. Agencies like the EPA can make whatever rules they think are best so long as it doesn't violate the clear directions from Congress. Congress is now allowed to delegate substantial discretion to the administrative agencies. We have completely lost the intent of the founders that executive power and legislative power be kept in separate hands. A Republican form of government is found where the laws are made by the elected representatives of the people. We have 200 books of federal administrative laws. In this arena, we are no longer a republic. And in Article I, Section 1, which proclaims that all legislative power shall be vested in the Congress of the United States, is violated by thousands of administrative laws. There are those who will argue that this situation is justified because our nation has become so complex that it is impossible for Congress to consider all the laws we need. We must have the administrative lawmaking function to fill in the details, they argue. But we must remember that the vast majority of these laws flow from a misreading of either the Commerce Clause or the General Welfare Clause. Congress would not be too busy to fully live up to its legislative duties if it wasn't chasing after the theory that it was the savior of mankind, trying to solve all the world's problems. It would only do the things set out in the Constitution. Congress would have plenty of time to pass the laws we need. Finally, we turn to the practice of presidents and state departments to enter into treaties, over 5,000 treaties, that have not been ratified by the United States Senate. How does the Supreme Court allow this to happen? It cannot be more clear in the text of the Constitution. And in international law, all of these so-called executive agreements are considered treaties. In a 1942 case, curiously named United States versus Pink, the Supreme Court decided the controversy between a private Russian company and the Soviet Union in an action brought by the United States government on behalf of the Soviet Union. When FDR recognized the Soviet Union as a nation in 1933, he entered into a treaty, he called it an executive agreement, with the USSR, which had the effect of agreeing to turn over all privately owned Russian companies that had property found in the United States. A Russian insurance company 
had substantial assets in the New York bank, and the U.S. government sued to take that money away from the private parties and give it to the Soviet Union pursuant to this executive agreement. Of course, the executive agreement was never presented to the United States Senate for ratification. But the failure of Franklin Roosevelt to seek ratification of this agreement by the Senate was of no consequence to the Supreme Court. They ruled the nation was to speak with one voice, and FDR had spoken. It did not seem to matter that our Constitution set up a procedure for conducting this particular kind of foreign policy. Written and binding legal agreements between two nations require Senate ratification. Despite this fact, New York's laws, which protected the assets of a private company, were overridden by FDR's private agreement with the Soviet Union. And we now have over 5,000 of these private agreements between a president and a foreign nation. And private people that are affected by these agreements have no recourse in our courts, thanks to a Supreme Court decision aptly named Hank. I hope it's obvious that we need presidents who understand and obey the Constitution, members of Congress in both houses who understand and obey the Constitution, and a president and a Senate who will cooperate together to make sure that our Supreme Court justices understand and obey the Constitution of the United States. When government acts and works and rules outside the Constitution, we are no longer a nation of laws. We become a nation of men. That is exactly the opposite of what the founders intended. When we've lost our legacy, we're losing our freedom. And that is why it is so important that we try to do what we can to really push people if we have to, to um, take the time to get educated on the Constitution. And um, there, are, there will be two opportunities for that. There is a um, John Birch Society Constitution Seminar that's set up for the Indian Valley Library, yeah. right? And this month. starts in this month. Yeah, it's, um, I believe it's Saturdays. It's Sundays. Sundays. It's Sunday, Sunday afternoon. And, okay. Uh, you know, again, Sunday afternoon. The information's on the back table there, but it's um, so critical that people be informed, and we've got to reach out and try to bring along, you know, folks that we know that aren't informed. I mean, it's great for us to go and increase our knowledge, but um, that is so critical. And then um, CCG started a, what we hope will be an annual tradition by having our own constitutional seminar in August, and that will be, um, the announcement of that date will be upcoming, but it will be a Saturday in August, and uh, probably right here. So um, those will be two opportunities, and we really need to, um, you know, purchase constitutions, give them to people, give them to young people. You know, there's young people who are willing to read or whatever. Um, we have some in the back, and we can let you know where they're available. Yes? Uh, we don't have that set up yet. Yeah. But, but we'll get that information to you as soon as we know. It'll be federal then, right? Yes. Last year was uh, state, so it will be federal this time. Okay, um, there is an event sheet in the back. Does anybody have these? Do you all already have these or no? Rebecca, could you hand those out? Uh, Kathy Fessler put this together for us. Uh, several opportunities here. Uh, the one at the top is uh, on the constitutional convention issue, which by the way will be our uh, topic in July. So if you want a preview, you can go to that um, coming up shortly here. The March for Marriage rally in Washington, D.C. Um, you're concerned about the direction our country is going to take morally, um, economically, socially, with um, the decision that was made by that uh, judge who I think believes he has the power of God to uh, contradict the will of the people. Um, in that realm, 
that's an opportunity, and Sandy's going to tell you more about that. And then um, a digital boot camp where you can brush up on your social media skills. We really need folks in this group. A lot of us are older and, and not too comfortable with the Facebook and the tweeting or twitting or whatever that is. <laughs> um, but it is a tremendously effective way to reach a lot of people, and we need to get young people out there. Um, there's a couple of these in the back. This one is a sample. The other one is available. The, the uh, Lehigh Valley Commentator, solidly conservative um, news, newspaper that comes out, I think, quarterly. I'm not sure. Does anybody get that? You get that, Rich? Or no, well, maybe you've seen it before. Yeah. But um, they're looking for columnists. If you like to write, uh, you can find their contact information here. I was hoping the gentleman who was the uh, editor Otto. would be with us. Otto. Otto. He was with us last uh, month, I believe. So um, please, you know, take a look at that. And um, also, any of you who are uh, writers or that kind of thing, there is a contest that um, I believe the deadline is July 4th. And it's for all age groups, and it's a patriot contest. Uh, you can do all kinds of um, things, as from writing an essay to producing a video, or whatever. Um, I believe the announcement is out on the front table. There, we'll make sure that that's available if, if you know anybody who'd be interested in that. Okay, and um, oh, I forgot to tell you, in case you don't know, the men's bathroom is off this back hall here, and there is another entrance. If you go through the lobby and around, you can take the roundabout way. Uh, that's where that is. The bathroom is in the uh, lobby there. All right, now, um, we wanted to move to um, a little report, short report, and um, some very encouraging news about patriots who took the time to get on a bus and go out to Harrisburg last Wednesday to um, support our legislators who are trying to put, push through this Paycheck Protection Act. Um, as you know, that, that would be a piece of legislation that would significantly alter the political power of the public sector unions because, lo and behold, when they have to collect their own dues, guess what? Their funds go down. <laughs> I wonder why. So. Um, it's uh, it's really a, an issue of fairness, though. It's it's not an anti-union issue. It's an issue of fairness and the misuse of taxpayer funds for political purposes because taxpayer money pays for those dues to be processed and it goes to the union's political agenda. So Kathy uh, is going to just uh, give us a quick report um, on a number of us who went on a bus out of Pennsburg, and then I've asked um, John if John Fletcher if he would telling you his experience going to see the legislators. Okay, Kat? Yeah. Okay. We had about 19 people, Jamie said, on the bus. Uh, they took it uh, to call for, from Pennsburg. But there were about 400 people, three or I can speak loud without this. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, 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 I get it. Um, there were three or four hundred people out there at the rally. Um, I think it, it, it was a good rally. And we had uh, of the 19 people that were on the bus, it looks like we probably visited and spoke with probably at least 10 senators and representatives concerning this issue, um, including. Pat Brown, Senator Brown, uh, Senator Mensch, Rep. Godshaw, Quinn, Simmons, uh, Bernie O'Neill, um, Farrar, I think. Uh, oh, yes. Captain Watson, uh, Senator McElhenney. So we spoke to quite a few, and um, well, we dropped off legislation with quite a few. They, uh, a lot of them were not available. Uh, to actually speak with us, but they're willing to give the information to the legislator. Um, and then on the way home, we um, Jamie asked the people that um, you know how their, how their experience went uh, as far as uh, speaking with representatives, and we had some very interesting uh, 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 talks with with, <laughs> with some of them. 
I know that I found out a few things as far as uh, the legislative process that um, I am in the process of correcting with my senator, McElhenney. How about that, Ken? Because I thought it's kind of visiting. Okay. We spoke with him, he was the only one that I actually, uh, we spoke with Sandy Slater and, and um, uh, John uh, spoke, and he led me to believe that, he led us to believe that that he could not put his name, he was not a co-signer on Paycheck Protection, which is um, SB um, uh, uh, 1034, because the reason initially that why he didn't co-sign, I'm not sure I, I caught, but he said that he could not put his name on it from this kind of court unless there was some action with Phil, which, you know, is completely false. And with that, and so I'm on him, with that, well, let's, um, so we have to know what goes on there <laughs> and how this actually runs. And it's a learning process. Uh, all of us that have, have gotten into this and trying to do what we can. But I want to let um, uh, John Fletcher uh, speak about his, uh, his experience with his legislator, his senator, and his, uh, his representative as an inspiration as an inspiration for others. Thank you. Um, just, just to let you know, my representative is Justin Simmons, and my uh, state senator is Pat Brown. I had heard of Pat Brown just recently after they redistricted the, uh, the state. Um, Simmons, uh, for those of you who don't know him, he's a 26-year-old kid, and uh, when he he got elected, he was 23. And uh, I guess it goes back about four years now, he challenged uh, Karen Beyer, who was the biggest rhino you could ever know. Uh, voted almost constantly with Democrats, even though she called herself a Republican. So he challenged her. And the, the thing that intrigued me about Simmons, I live about 10 minutes from here in the woods. And um, he visited all the homes out there personally. And I had never had any any kind of uh, uh, government guy, except maybe the IRS, but I didn't answer the door, <laughs> visit my home before. And I, I wasn't home the first time, and he left a little note, and he actually showed up a second time. So uh, that word of mouth and some of my neighbors were really surprised at that, and we really got on the Simmons bandwagon. Um, he was a big conservative. He, uh, you know, he, he looked the part. And uh, he actually beat Karen Beyer in the primary, and then he won his, uh, his election. Uh, he's been out there three and a half years now. So um, we got there a little early, I think it was about 45 minutes before the rally, and uh, we decided, uh, Sharon, my friend, and, and Bob, and uh, Brian, I'm not sure if he's here tonight, I don't think he is. We went, uh, he, we went to visit his office, and he's got a secretary you know, by the name of Lori who I dealt with before, and she's rather nice, but um, she played the little game. Well, I'm not sure he's in the office, but we could hear him talking <laughs> around the corner. So uh, Sharon knows uh, Justin Simmons' mother very well. Sharon was just uh, elected a councilwoman, uh, or a committee woman, I'm sorry, uh, in the uh, Lower Saucon Township area in the Lehigh County. So uh, Mary Ann was... Um, for that. Yeah. It's unpaid, uh, but uh, so Simmons agreed to see us, and we went in, and we didn't. I, I don't believe we had the information about who was sponsoring the bill in the House at the time going out there. We had the Senate information, so we first thing we did we said uh, we, we're here about paycheck protection, and how do you feel about that? He goes, I'm totally for it. And uh, I think he said they had 90 people co-sponsoring it. I believe he said that. I might be wrong. And um, he, uh, I said to him, well, are you co-sponsoring? And he goes, no, I'm not doing that. And um, I said, why not? He said, well, you got to understand, there's not a big difference between co-sponsoring and being for something. And you could tell he was like getting kind of a little edgy and, just, yeah, edgy and a little embarrassed. Because again, we, we've known this guy for, for the, the quite a bit. Uh, so 
he uh, he says, and you know the unions would run, put up fifty to one hundred fifty thousand dollars against me in my uh, re-election campaign. So the first thing I said was, oh, wait a minute, you know you're running against Aaron Byer's son. Now the guy, as of March, was still a Republican living in Allegheny County. So they can't get anybody to against, run against him, and so they pulled this guy out, brought him back. He's living with his mother in, in somewhere in Lehigh County, and um, nobody really knows who he is or what he stands for. He said, "You really think you're going to lose to this guy? Even if the union put up one hundred fifty thousand dollars?" And he 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 kind of got well, maybe not. I don't know. Then uh, Sharon used the old, uh, "Well, I'm really disappointed in you, Justin." That routine. <laughs> And uh, because, again, the guy up until now had been very conservative in his, in his thought patterns. And then uh, I remember Bob using the thing, well, you know, if you really wanted to come here and make a difference, you got you to gotta take a chance and you got to stand out. And, and if you want to be great at something, you got to do it when times are tough. So... Um, Looking back, some of the things he said as well, there was more to it than just the union. He has he has no confidence in Corbett winning re-election. He basically said that. He said he's done. Uh, so, you know, I think he thinks it's going to get a little tougher in, in Harrisburg for him come, uh, come January. Um, he also said, and this was kind of disappointing, that if it doesn't get passed, any of these bills that are up uh, to, be, to be voted on don't get passed by... June 30th, they're not going to get, they're not going to get done at all, because they've got a recess. Then they go on their their little campaign trips, and then of course the lame duck session. Nothing of any significance he thought would get done. So I don't think he wanted to stick his neck out. That's the bottom line. So he gave us 15 minutes. I, I can't complain about that face to face. And when we got up, he said we were starting to walk out and shook hands. He said, you know. I'm going to rethink this this situation, and you, you, you didn't know if he was just saying that, you know, it's, ah, I don't care, because uh, I know these people pretty well. I don't want them to think too bad of me or whatever. And when I was talking to Kathy last night, I think it was, she said Simmons' name is now a co-sponsor on the vote. Oh, yeah. so, it really, it really did make a difference going out there. So we had the rally, and you know they. Let me just say a little bit about AFP, Americans for Prosperity. I've gone on about six of their trips to Washington and Harrisburg. And, you know, it was 10 bucks to ride the bus out there, nice bus, you get food, all that stuff. They treat you good. They get really quality people to speak. They had Michelle Malkin out there. They had a couple of the, uh, the top people on this bill uh, speak. And, um, you know, they even had a security guy with us, a paid security guy. He looked like a... a Secret Service guy. <laughs> had the sunglasses on and the three piece suit, you know. Fortunately, we didn't need any of that, but, uh, you know, they, they did that. I assume they paid for that. I don't know the story. Um, but uh, I've been to two of their conventions down in D.C., and they really put on a, a top notch uh, program. They don't, if you get on their mailing list, they don't send you emails all the time asking for money and all this kind of nonsense. So uh, I, and whenever I hear Dingy Harry bring up the Koch brothers, I just smile and say, yeah, we're, they're having an effect, you know. And, you know, Obama mentions AFP at times, or he did. So um, that whole thing of Simmons, when I heard that he had actually co-sponsored that bill, it was, was really made me feel good and gave me uh, a motivation to keep at it. So after the rally, um, we went, we tried to go see Pat Brown, and we got to his office, and lo and behold, Pat Brown was standing in the hall. Because I didn't think there'd be any chance of us getting in there to see him. Because the last time I'd been out there, I tried to see Bob Mench, who used to be my center, and he kind of blew us off. So, uh, that was a year ago. So, um, Brown's standing out there trying to hold court, and he's been there 21 years, totally opposite of what Simmons has been. He's the majority whip in the Senate, okay? So, I mean, I watched House of Cards, and I, I guess uh, Spacey really wasn't the traditional majority uh, whip, but uh, I, said to, I said to Brown, how do you feel about this bill? And he goes, well, I'm for it, but I'm not putting my name on it. 
So uh, he said, I think he said they had 23 senators that were in favor of voting for it. I guess you need 25 plus one. So I said, now my understanding is there's about 27 Republicans, I think, in the Senate. I could be wrong about that. I think it's a couple majority there. And uh, he said, if I can get 25 people, I'll be the 26th vote. Now, he was totally arrogant, totally condescending. He says, I said, you know, the majority whip, if you're for it, you're supposed to get, you're supposed to pull people along with you. He goes, you don't know how it works in this area. He says, I've been here 21 years. I said, I said, well, how does it work? He says, well, he says, like with uh, with Corbin, he says, you you guys come out here and you say, uh, you know, he's not getting anything done and and uh, he's not a leader and all this. He says, who would you want, Corbin or you want Wolf? I said, I don't want either. I said, I'd rather have Medcalf up there, but he's not right. <laughs> so um, he was getting he. We now had about seven or eight people around him, and he was just making himself look really stupid, frankly. And uh, the thing you, you, you realize is, if you don't, if they're out there too long, and they don't have any principles, they really don't care. You know, because he, he said, "You'd rather have my opponent in here than me." And again, you know, it's probably not. You know, I mean, when when you had to vote for Romney, you'd rather have Romney than Obama two years ago. But you don't like either one of them necessarily. You know. And this is the way these people think out there. Yeah. These guys that have R after their name a lot of them just think, oh, well, you know. And there's so much legislation out there that doesn't get done. And that's, I told them, I said, that's why Corbin's going to lose. Yeah. Yeah. Because principal conservatives will stay home. Or they'll, they may not stay home, but they won't push the lever for Corbin or whoever. And that's what I do with Charlie Dent. You know, Charlie Dent's my congressman. I couldn't see any way in hell that I could go to his office and sit in front of him. You know, he's so far removed from from things now, it's, it's unbelievable. And, you know, he votes with Boehner and them all the time. And he's not even being opposed by a Democrat this election. So, um, there, there's a quote I have from, uh, Ronald Reagan is one of my favorite guys, and this is an obscure quote, but uh, this is one I, I like. It's, he says, the last view of big government should be in the rear view mirror as we leave it behind. And, I mean, that, that is exactly what we should be doing in our federal government right now. Thanks. Uh, positive reinforcement is so important. When this guy you heard changed his mind, you have to get back and say, Wonderful, wonderful, thank you. You know, we yeah. really appreciate it. We will vote for you. I totally agree with you. And that will happen tomorrow. Absolutely right. And even if you're not in this district. We have uh, his information with us. Yes, Carol. Um, well, I was on the bus trip. And when I heard this happen with Pat Brown, when I got home, it was playing on my mind for two days. And I thought, you know, I've been down to Harrisburg a lot. They're usually quite nice, you know, but as you leave, you know, well, they don't do what they want, but uh, I'm learning the ropes. And so uh, I called his office. Um, uh, called, it's on, it's on, yeah. I called Pat Brown's office, and uh, I said, you know, I said, this has been on my mind, and I'm just calling to let you know that I was very disappointed uh, when people on my bus, well, I wasn't there, but <laughs> I kind of said I was. And uh, I said, you know, I was very disappointed in the way uh, Senator Brown treated people who really had valid questions for him. Oh, he never, he's not like that. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, he's never like that. Oh, I was, well, he was that day. And I said, yeah. I'm very disappointed. And I just wanted to let you know, and please pass that on to him, because we are the people, you know, who have voted him in. And when we say something, we expect that, you know, they listen. And they usually run away. They don't even hang around. But, uh, you know, when they are there. Now, he was rude. And I, I told the lady, I said, he was rude. But um, now, I did find out from a friend of mine. And I said, well, if he's really not for paycheck protection, he's for the union. He might be Republican, but he's for the union. So, 
Yep, special interest. Yeah. 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 Right? Yeah. 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 Uh, for the Paycheck Protection Act, the, um, there's information on the back table that looks like this. We also sent that out as an email, I believe, today, right, Phil? I think that went out today. So uh, you can access it that way, too. But um, I, I looked at the information that we had kind of gathered from Harrisburg and what I could find online. The bill is definitely going to pass in the House. So uh, Metcalf and Cutler both said, no problem in the House, the problem is with the Senate. All right, on the Senate side, and you see on the back of this, it has the, the Senate State Government Committee that is holding up the process. It also has the House State Government Committee, all 15, not all 15, 13 of those 15 Republicans were co-sponsors. Now, thankfully, to our activists who went out to Harrisburg, now 14 of the 15 are co-sponsors. Um, and the information here indicates uh, the one that is not. But on the state government, uh, on the Senate side, you have um, a chair who is not a co-sponsor. You have a vice chair who is a co-sponsor. Then the president pro tempore, who is also an officer, you know, a, and a leader, also not a co-sponsor. Essentially, there's seven. Yes, there's seven Republicans, and only three are co-sponsors yeah. on this. And we need um, at least six to get it out of committee, much less under the floor. And then we were told that they think that they're at least two Senate votes short of a majority if it comes to a floor vote. So it first has to get out of committee to go to the floor. And the, um, the way to get that done is to call, number one, the Senate leaders. So the Senate uh, majority leader is Pelleggi, and then this Brown, unfortunately, is uh, the whip. Neither one of them are actively pushing it. Um, and then you call the, the chair and these Republicans on the state government committee and tell them you want it out on the floor, as well as calling your own representative and, and uh, senator. But it has momentum. The problem is they're hearing a whole heck of a lot more from teachers the teachers unions who don't you know I, I love teachers but <laughs> on, on this issue they're just following you know what they're told to do I guess by the bosses and not really looking at the issue um, clearly but they get flooded with these teachers letters and and phone calls so um, please please uh, either take this information or access it online this uh, gives you guidelines as far as you know what you can say and and who you can call but um, Letters are even more effective than calls, okay? Um, so if you t can take the time to write, that'd be terrific. And we do have some information as far as uh, addresses and whatever available when we break up at the end of the meeting into some action stations, you know, that's gonna be available to you, or you can just find it online, it's not hard to find. But um, the most effective thing is a personal visit, right? Justin Simmons got his name on there because of a personal visit. Okay, one of the holdups um, from our perspective on this committee is Chuck McElhaney's. So, uh, we are going to go... What's that? Who mentions that are only two more are needed, but he, and he's on the committee, yeah. but he, he won't he respond. Yeah. So, and Chuck is the one who always postures himself as a conservative, on the right side of these things, but uh, he needs tremendous pressure. So I'm sending this around. Um, we are going to go visit him, and I would love to go visit him with 10 people. Um, the, the more the better. We don't have a date yet, so if you'll put your email and your phone number down, we'll get back to you and we'll set up a date, hopefully next week, when he's in town, which I'm assuming is a Thursday or Friday. That's constituents for Matt Mahiney, yes. So if you are in a different state senator district, um, and I'm also going to pass around a petition that we signed on the bus. So if you already signed this, folks, on the bus, you don't want to sign it again. This was put together by the Berks County Patriots, and we're turning it back into them, and then they're going to, um, you know, turn them in and mass to their legislators. So I'm going to send that around as well. But um, please, you know, put your name down if we have to be in Berks. No, no, no. This is uh, anyone in the state of Pennsylvania. Yeah. So, um, yes, Jay. 
I called uh, McElhaney's office today. Okay. I mean, they know me. I've been doing this for a couple years, so I could tell them that I know voters in their district. Right. So anyway, my name is Jay Russell. I thank you for the people who voted for me. Jay ran for State Republican Committee. Party. Courageous uh, challenge to the endorsed. And the leader of the Republican Party in Bucks County sent out a letter trying to make me famous. You know, praising me about all the things I've done over 20 years. <laughs> so that's Thank you. that's Thank how it goes when you pop your head up. You know, yeah. You, you yeah. get a shot at. Yeah. Actually, saying that because he ran for multiple offices over many years of involvement, he was making a mockery of the process. Oh, uh, that's it's a shame. A mockery of you know, what exact process is that? I where a citizen who's involved enough to put out their money and their time to run for office. Is making a mockery. No. Oh, no, that was from the Bucks Yellow County Square. chairwoman. Yeah. yeah, that letter. White Square. Yeah. White Square. Yes, Robert. Three White Square. So I was number one. Uh, next to not. I'm sorry. Are you done, Jay? Yeah. Okay. They're very staunch conservative. Do a great job in everything they do. She's now elected as a committee woman. John's been doing what we call words of wisdom and other things. If you want to get on his list for emails, I help him expand the list. And I'm an editor, journalist type guy. I'll get to a bank of job with that. Yeah, great. All right, we need to move on. But thank you so much for being um, active in uh, participating in this Paycheck Protection. It is very, very important that the action you take happens like this week. Yeah. Because um, it really needs to get on the floor for a vote by the end of this month before the summer, you know, recess and whatever. Um, so we really need every single one of you, and please pass word along to people that you know. Uh, for this uh, email that was already sent to you. 20 seconds more. I was on a, <laughs> I was on a tear, so I called Senator Greenlee's office. I, caroled, I called uh, Daryl Metcalf's office. I called my Senator Thomason's office. I called a few, because these people know me, and uh, I don't know why I did it. I went to the website. So thank Bill for such a good website. Yes. Uh, you know, I'm really, uh, yeah. I just can't put Great. up with it. Great. And I've been Terrific. writing for so long. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Nope. And actually, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Greenleaf. Even if you're not in his district, if you're in the area, I'm going to call him even though I'm out of his district. Especially if you're a committee woman, committee women, you should definitely call these. Um, but even if you're not, if you're in the area, you can say, I have friends. I'm telling them you're not supporting this, you know. That puts a little pressure on. Yeah. Okay, let's move along. Um, we have been very thankful to have a very active uh, group of ladies who have been working on the Common Core issue, and uh, I've asked them tonight to give us a report on, um, you know, what it is, where it is with legislation, what they've been up to, and um, there will also be a couple of uh, action items I think that, that they will um, encourage you to, to participate in. Very important if you have children, grandchildren, or if you care about children which I'm sure is everybody, very important issue. So Carol Allen, former teacher, um, up, lives up in the Allentown area, and this lady has been putting lots, lots of miles on her car, going to Harrisburg and back, and a lot of time working on this issue. So Carol. I like it. I wish I didn't have to do it for the reason that I'm doing it, but I like getting out and talking with people and trying to get them to see my way. Because <laughs> I'm right. <laughs> so, well, um, I worked for 37 years. I've added up oh, 37 years. That's impossible, but uh, I have. And because of this country, I, I consider myself so fortunate that I've had opportunities and I've taken them. Um, and I, I'm a teacher. I taught for 26 years, and I worked at Air Products for five years, and left teaching. And then uh, my husband and I moved to New Jersey, and I ended up getting a job in New York City for TIA Craft. I was a manager of a training group there. So I've been on the teaching side and the business side, and I think we can all agree that we want our children to be the best they can be, that they can get the best jobs. Um, go around the world if they want to, but have the opportunities that we all had and take them, you know, if you get them. But those those things are going away now and, and it up, upsets me so much because uh, I know <laughs> how teachers work hard and teachers are really trained to, um, you know, to take children from where they are, you know, and we're all different. And this new system they have now is, I consider it a one-size-fits-all. And I was down in, uh, 
representative of Climbers Education Committee, and I was standing behind one of the representatives, and he called children widgets. Now, a widget to me is they're all the same. Well, yeah. children are not all the same. And uh, this process that they've come up with. Now, I just found an article today that um, it's been 50 years that the government has been involved, involved in our education. And it's 50 years too long. Yeah. And I've been involved in it for most, a lot of that time. Um, and they, they go for about 10 years, and then they change the name and call it something else. Like, uh, you know, they had uh, outcome-bound education in the 80s. Now, that's when I was in the business world, so I kind of missed that. But then when I came back in the end of the 90s into 2000, they had Goals 2000. That was Clinton's. Then they went to No Child Left Behind, which really, I, said, I tell people now, they all blame Bush. Well, Bush took it from Teddy Kennedy. It was Teddy Kennedy's baby. He came up with it. And he was kind of on the way out, and then he and Bush were getting to be friends, and he pushes it on Bush, and Bush, like a dumbbell, says, okay, we'll continue on with this. And I, I had to take care of it as far as uh, being a reading specialist in the Livingston, New Jersey uh, school district, and uh, we all complained, you know, was teaching to the test. And uh, that's not what teaching is about. We want to teach for knowledge. Well, they don't want us to be too smart anymore, you know. Yeah. Dumbing down has been the word. And I, I can never figure out, you know, here I am teaching at home. What's dumbing down? You know, I was in a good school district, but when you see what's going on in the cities, you go, oh, I know what the dumbing down is. And I taught in uh, South Mountain in Allentown in 1972. That was my first teaching job. And I taught three classes of German foreign language, and then this remedial reading class came with it. And uh, I said, whoa, boy, this reading. Well, I can read, so how far can that be? So I had about 30 kids in my class, eighth grade. And so I said, OK, who'd like to read? Well, nobody. <laughs> no. yeah. wow. OK, well, are you sure? <laughs> well, come to find out, they were on a first grade reading oh, level. Oh. And I had one kid who was a possible fourth grade reading level. I really stretched it. You know? And uh, that was 40 some years ago and it hasn't changed all that much. It's not the, I spoke to the school district, um, the uh, state school board down in Harrisburg, and they said 70% of the schools in Pennsylvania are proficient or above, advanced proficient, which is very good. And the 30% are the big cities, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Harrisburg, Allentown, so forth. But um, anyway, uh, I want to get back to Common Core here a little bit. Can I see how many people um, don't know anything about it or haven't really heard that title so you guys are all up to speed oh all right cool um we did have peg Fluffick uh here quite a while ago and she kind of started us off on this what was it a year ago or something and uh things have transpired and actually recently i think things are getting better um let's see um recently uh since you all kind of have a decent idea about what's going on. I'll uh, just say that recently uh, there was something that was, was really very hopeful. Um, Oklahoma, uh, Governor Mary Fallon, uh, who is a Republican, and she's up for governor again in November, and Governor Haley from South Carolina, they both signed bills that their legislature put together and voted um, to have Common Core taken out of their state. Now, it's not actually a done deal, but it's pretty darn good because okay. they're not like Pennsylvania and Indiana because they just rename common core state standards. Ours are Pennsylvania academic standards. Well, if you put them side by side, they're exactly the same except maybe a couple commas were kind of spread around the different. <laughs> And they will lie to my face when I go down to Harrisburg. Oh, we don't do common. Well, yes, you do. <laughs> We're right here. They could be looking at it and reading it and say, it's not the same. Well, it's not because there's a couple of commas in there. <laughs> That's what, uh, yeah, right. Um, so the overview, I guess, um, that I'm seeing, it is so convoluted, you can't believe it, because I've been probably in this for about two years. And in the beginning, of, you know, nobody knew anything about this. It was under the radar, you know, and all this race to the top, I guess, was about the first thing maybe that I heard. So I like teaching, and I'm 
following. So, what's this? Oh, uh oh, well, they're getting money. Hmm, okay. Well, um, there are a select few groups who are in this to make money. And it's greed. And it's Bill Gates. And it's the McKinsey Consulting Corporation that's taking care of all the data collection that you hear about, data mining, all these things, hundreds. Four, over 400 data points, and I heard 528 the other day, uh, uh, data that they want on each child from the time they're born until the time, P20 they call it, two years out into the workforce. And uh, they'll swear up and down, they're not doing it in Harrisburg, but they are. And um, I guess uh, when I see all these very greedy people who have billions of dollars to begin with, it really aggravates me, you know, but... Um, they're looking out for themselves, and it's the elites. And I also found another thing. Now, with our children um, and all this testing and so forth, uh, we don't know how much this is going to cost. Senator Dinneman has asked every which way, up and down, sideways of the state, can't find out how much it's going to cost. Uh, what is, how do you say her name? Dumarques? Dumar Dumares. Uh, she is the Secretary of Education. Harrisburg. And she says it's revenue neutral, which means it's not going to cost any more than what we're paying anyway, which is un it's impossible. So, uh, I, uh, well, it, it's, it's all, I say it's like Obamacare. Now, if somebody had some common sense, they would have said, well, 30 million people don't have health care, let's say. Maybe it's 30 people who don't have health care, but okay, they need it. Why bother the rest of us right. when those 30 or 30 million, whatever it is, will just give them what they need? And I'm not against, I don't think any of us are, are against giving people who truly need it, not these pylons and, you know, well, I'll get something and I'll just get in there too. But um, I guess uh, <laughs> it really is kind of the same thing I would say as Obamacare. Uh, they've taken the whole country, every school district, all the teachers, and they are supposed to teach the exact same thing at the exact same time. So uh, the, and the reasoning was they thought this was a good idea. So because the military kind of move around and they go from this base to over this base and they move their children. And if they are over here in school and then they move over here to Arkansas, they're going to be doing the same thing in Arkansas, so they're not going to lose out. Well, that's ridiculous. Yeah. People are moving all the time, and the kids do fine. But they, you know, they have to think of some screwball reason to do anything that they're doing these days. So um, it really is a convoluted thing, but I, I am hopeful that uh, you know people are really starting to see. I call it uh, what I call it my mass. Um, I always have a term for it. Uh, that you get more on this side uh, gradually. It's a slow process and all of a sudden more people coming uh, on your side and then all of a sudden it flips over because the one, there are fewer over here that aren't really in on it and they want to know what you guys know. So it is starting to come. It's, it's a slow process but I think things are, are a lot better than they were. Um, well, New York is ahead of Pennsylvania so you don't hear that much in Pennsylvania. You might hear some, some teachers don't talk about it. Administrators don't talk about it because they take their marching orders from the state and they're afraid of losing their jobs. Now I thought, well, if somebody had some guts, they'd say, look, you know, I, I can't come to work. This isn't what I was brought up to do, but people do need a job. So it is understandable. It is a tough thing to deal with. But New York is ahead of us. They've done some of this uh, testing, uh, kind of like we call the Keystone test. They have something similar. And all aligned to the Common Core. Well, only a third of the state passed. Now, when you do change tests, there is a drop in the scores, but there's not that much of a drop. And the way they put it together, um, it wasn't educators who put it together in the first thing, which really gets me. It's like, oh, oh boy. And you can't see any of the tests. The teachers can't see what the questions are. So you're teaching blind. I, I, how are we supposed to do it? These standards, standards to me, aren't much of anything. It's a guide. It's the lowest of what you want to teach. Some kids have to try to come up and meet that floor. Sometimes they call it. 
Yes, and then the smarter kids want to go way beyond that. You know, we have a lot of kids who can surpass these standards. So, um, so I hand it back. Yes. Isn't there a fee every time the child has to take the test? Well, there's the, a fee the, paid, the and test? if the kid pass, if he flunks the test three or four times, that yeah. fees, that's where they're making the money on the oh, test. Oh yes, absolutely. And, because and kids aren't Pearson's passing, and they've got to take it over. Oh no, they're not passing. It's plain right. failure. Yep. But in New York, they have had a letter. Uh, I have it somewhere. Five hundred and fifty-six principals finally got together and put a, a letter together and sent it to the. Um, Secretary of uh, Education in New York, this uh, Mr. King, and that's uh, saying something, you know, that they realize it isn't right. And they all ha have had parents up and all, you know, so it's starting to heat up. Peg Luxick is over there. She's been working with that Rob Astorino, who was running against uh, Cuomo for governor. And he's used Common Core as one of his main things. And he was on Fox maybe two, three months ago, and he opted his children out of the testing, and he talked about it on, I saw him talk about it, so uh, that's a good thing too. And uh, so, yes? yes I, I just wanted to cooperate something you said earlier about Paul Clymer. Um, Lynn and I went to visit Paul Clymer. Oh, yes, okay. And uh, he, he said that we're, we do not have common core in Pennsylvania, that is a true state, that's what he said to us. Oh, uh, I, pres I presented to him about five bills, uh, most of them with Bill Metcalf's name on them. And he, he looked at them and he said, uh, there's no reason to have these uh, passed or come out of committee or whatever the, the, the legal terminology is. These were 600 million dollars, New York State got over 300 bill, uh, 3 billion, and Pennsylvania got over 1.9 billion just for signing on to two things for Common Core. They had to accept the standards as is. Now that means they have a copyright on it, which I have never in my whole life heard, but they're owned 
paid for by our tax money, which really gets me, 80% is paid for. Uh, by this, they call it the National Governors Association, but it's a, a private trade group right. in Washington. Right. And David Coleman, who's not a teacher, and his cronies, who are not teachers, put this garbage together. And it's not developmentally appropriate for a lot of the grades. They just kind of threw things together, and we're supposed to take it. Well, we're not taking it. Uh, it's not correct for children. So uh, that's part of the thing. Oh, you, you mentioned the, the two educators that were brought into the community, the math expert and the English expert, and what yeah. they're... Well, I'm going to a, a conference. They're having a, a Common Core Summit. Uh, people against Common Core. It's going to be in Austin, Texas, and it's the 20th and 21st of June, so I'm getting ready to go. And it's across the street from the convention center where the National PTA, Parent Teachers Organization, is meeting, and their keynote speaker is Arnie Duncan. So I'm going over there and give him a kick in the shins. <laughs> so, uh, is Denim going to be there by any chance? I don't know. I'm the only one from around here, and I didn't, I wouldn't have known about it if it weren't one of my friends. I'm on this Yahoo group around the country with people from all different states, and Sandra Stotsky, uh, which Jamie just mentioned, is uh, one of the people that was to review these standards, and she reviewed them for the language arts part, and she did them, uh, actually Massachusetts has actually been the best in, in recent years before all the common board jumped. Um, they were doing very well, probably the leading state in New Jersey doesn't do that either. Um, but um, she said, what did she say? My poor little head. <laughs> oh, she refused to sign. And this uh, James Ingram, who's from Stanford, he did the math. And he refused to sign because it's not appropriate for children, it's disorganized, and he has a whole bunch. Now, those two people are going to speak. Um, in Austin, uh, they, I, I'm on this website, and Sandra says there are five people that refuse to sign, but they only mention those two names. They don't want it to be known that there are more people who really didn't like this stuff. So, uh, we are only two educational experts right, who were brought in to, yeah. um, yes, to kind of okay this stuff, and they and refuse. This is and Sandra Stotsky is a dyed-in-the-wool liberal Democrat from Massachusetts. But she's an educator, and uh, we're moving away from from classic text and, and other least valuable things, things to reading all kinds of ridiculous non-fiction. Well, they want informational text. Now, I'm a reading specialist, and that really irks me because a lot of the classics that we've always read, that's part of how kids learn about life and, and have discussions on, you know, why these people did that or did that. Well, they want, by the time you get to, I think, 11th and 12th grade, they only want 30% to be the classics and 70% to be the EPA manual. Right? The, oh, yeah, well, they don't like to read as it is, and they're going to want to read that. Not that I'm not for informational reading. There are certain things that I think they should be familiar with. They are going out into the working world. Um, I'm an adjunct professor, not right now, but I was for two years at Lehigh, and I've been out for that kind of grind up. I went up to L Tri C. And these kids, um, they, they really cannot speak two sentences. They can't explain anything. And I, I do want to say that, you know, people say, well, there must be something good in the standards. Well, there are. There are some good things that I would keep. And some of it is like with the math, they want you to explain how you got your answer. I'm not against that. I'd like them to be able to verbalize it, but not every single problem. They're slowing things down for the kids. They have them doing these long things, drawing pictures, and doing in fourth grade. Now, fourth graders who are on grade level or above don't need to be drawing pictures. Little kids do, special ed kids do, maybe I do <laughs> certain things, because that's not my strong suit. But, um, you know, they're they're just uh, playing games with this and, and how we learn just to divide something and get an answer. They want you to draw 18 little faces and 90 hash marks, you know. Well, that takes time. But I think it is good to talk and because kids don't talk much. They're always on their machines. So, yeah. Did you hear within the last couple of days that Gates is supposedly quoted as saying that he's getting so much pushback and there's so much chaos with this testing 
that the testing should be delayed for two years. Ooh, I haven't heard that. You didn't hear that? Yeah, I nope. heard that. hope you're right. <laughs> Anybody else hear that? I read it. What did you read? I'm sorry, would you wow. repeat that? It would be election Z. Oh, well, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, what's your name? John. John. John just mentioned that he read about Bill Gates saying that he's getting so much pushback on these tests, he thinks they should be held up for two years. Yes. Well, I think they should be held up forever. I want to go back. I mean, the easiest thing to do is go back to the standards that the states had. Pennsylvania has the very good standards. It should be local, and it should be, mm -hmm. you know, just whatever your school districts. They have, they have all different needs. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the South is different from us. You know, hot down there, they're slower. Well, we're up here in the Northeast, and that's all go, go, go with New York and business. And it, it's different mm -hmm. uh, all over the country. They have different needs. And, uh, but it's, uh, I think it's starting to heat up. But we do need parents. Uh, to really start to, you know, talk about it and to come out. And, and I'm, I'm seeing that starting. And the other thing is in September, we want to have something across the country to remind parents that they can opt out their children from the testing. So we're trying to get that going. But yes? But uh, as a mother, right, I have three kids, and they're all out of school now. But I mean, each one of those kids learn differently. Absolutely. And they're individuals, and they each like and dislike different things. You mm -hmm. cannot put kids in a program that's mm -hmm. going to standardize them and make them be little companies. Well, you know where that came from? It's communism, Marxism, yes. socialism, yeah, that's whatever right. you want to call it. And to add a little scarier part to it, um, now Peg Luxick told me this, and oh boy, I, I go by what she says. I haven't been part of this, but she said that, you know, it's really they're looking at the children's behaviors, too. That's part oh, yeah. of these data collection sure. things, you know, whether they're itchy in their seat or they got upset over this, and they're documenting all this stuff. Well, we all get upset at some point, you know, some, over something, but you don't want it following you your whole life. And uh, she had said that, in third grade, they kind of look at what you're doing, and they, they document certain things. But by eighth grade, you will be given, not you, but the child will be given three choices of a job. Well, pretty much. And that maybe you get to be a garbage man, a waiter, or a landscaper person. <laughs> and the parent can look at that, but it can't be changed. Now I said, oh yeah, I want children to do what right. they aspire to. Right. Absolutely. You know, even if the guidance counselor says, well, you're going to be an engineer because your math isn't good. And I've heard that so many times. And when kids want to do it, they will work to do it, and they'll do it. Mm -hmm. And yes? Well, we're fighting the fight. I, I'm not, not removing myself from the fight. Okay. But if you have children or grandchildren, what is a real alternative to public school that isn't impacted by common law. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right now there are some avenues, but down the road there's not going to be any because they want it to affect homeschooling. Oh, yeah. They want it to yeah. affect the Catholic schools right. and the, the lower private schools, um, you know, like Swain. You know, it's not 150000 a year to go there, but it's pricey um, because you have to take the test that the state gives at the end. So if you haven't studied that, and you haven't gone through whatever these so-called standards are, and they say that you can do the curriculum any way you want. Well, that's not true. Um, yes, well, I've heard that from a lot of people, and he's obviously not a teacher, because you yeah. can't do it. <laughs> and, uh, because you need to know what the tests are at the end, and the standards and the tests drive what's in between. That's how you know what to teach. So, um, you know, that's coming. But they tell you right now you can do it any way you want, and it's impossible. Mm -hmm. So they have it on the um, SAS aligned uh, on the state website. And they have it right there, and that's what a lot of teachers are going to. They're using the one, the curriculum, on the, the state website. Because why spend the money and the time to redevelop something that you don't know what you're doing? I mean, it's awful. Yes. As you said in the beginning, this is a version of Obamacare. How Obamacare is tracking your medical visit and what you should have done is be enrolled. 
this, they are, they are tracking the child's progress from grade to grade, and they are stigmatizing that child to continue. Right. That's exactly right. We can't have that. We can't have that. And there is so much money behind this, it's almost like trying to turn the Titanic uh, 55 times, you know. And this is the monumental task, but that's why we need people to understand that. We need people to stand up. So, yeah. Lynn. Oh, well, um, for anybody that hasn't really looked at, has been able to look at the standards and what they're doing, and then, you know, they're, they're the same everywhere. There were three copies of Duke Texas speech back there. If anybody wants them for their adult children, their grandchildren, they're back there, they're 350. And, and can we have a sign-up list in case those three go? Oh, I'll put a piece of paper out. Or an order. Okay, yeah, once do do they go. Yes, we can order. Yeah. I mean, it's an, he, that it's was an excellent speech. He, yeah, for over like, like two hours and ten minutes, and I didn't move. And yeah, I knew something about Common yeah. Core going in. You were there. Yeah. We didn't move at all, did right. we? We no. just on the edge of my seat the, the whole time. time. Mm -hmm. That's right. I'm sending around a petition. I actually have it at, in a letter. <coughs> excuse me, in a letter form. It's coming from the back over there. Oh. I'm sending around a petition concerning Common Core. Uh, I, I made a few copies. I meant it to be as a letter, and people can take it if they want after the end of the meeting if we have time, and recompose something to uh, Representative Clymer. He is the chair of the Education Committee. He will not bring these, these bills up uh, at a committee for, for a vote. He's a lame duck, and he's not, well, not he working. Well, he is, but this letter, <laughs> All we can do is to keep nagging him. Uh, I think we need an address. For a petition, you should put your address as well as your name. Okay. So it's to try. It's a little bit of a guilt trip for him at the end uh, to get him to leave office and not leave this undone. Um, so you can read it briefly. You can take a copy. There's more copies back home if you want to uh, give it to, to somebody else or compose your own letter to him. There's an excellent um, letter uh, by a friend of Carol's that we're going to have posted on the website. It's, it's not the two-hour video, which is terrific, but it's a wonderful letter. It sums up everything that Common Core is, where it came from, and it's kind of where I, I, I put together this short synopsis that's going around for your signatures. Um, and it has wonderful documentation, and I hope to have that on the website. So if you know, it's seven pages, and she sent it to Governor Corbett, and it's wonderful. It, it really is. So please sign, and we'll see if we can't get him to do something. He was also getting that DVD. I'm going to take it back again. Thank you. Okay, I'll be real fast. I just want to um, sort of remind us that last year, I don't remember the gentleman who presented. Uh, agenda 21, but he said that Agenda 21, Common Core, and Sustainable Development are intermarried. Now, there are a couple of other things. Um, just working with the team on Common Core, I'm saying that it's bleeding profusely in the United States. It is really, really uh, hazardous. It's detrimental. Um, some of the reasons why I say that, um, you mentioned intentional failure. Uh, there was something that I read where even if you don't speak the language, you still have to take the test. And it's like us trying to take a test in Greek. We're going to fail. Math you do. Uh, if you're new to this country, you get a year to take some English, but then after that year, you have to take the English test. Well, the other thing is that 80% you know? oh of the taxpayers um, are uh, paying for this. And you're saying, and, and what I'm saying is this. It's no wonder the, uh, that I think there's another conflict too with the Paycheck Protection, for example. Teachers will not speak up because some of those unions have actually protected the teacher from losing their jobs. Well, they protect uh, the poor teachers. Teacher. Yes. They don't have to protect the good teachers. So most teachers are good. Well, you know, or because they want they're to doing be the well. best they can yeah, be. Yeah, they're doing well. Yeah. The other thing is that uh, we don't speak about this, but um, I can put this uh, out uh, so that it will be on the uh, MailChimp about S um, 1974. It's a federal bill, and they're asking us to contact the senators in reference to this. What this would do, uh, the wording is to amend the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965 
to prohibit federal education mandates and for other purposes. As so uh, we need we only work on uh, Pennsylvania and since I do pro life we work Pennsylvania and pro life and uh, federal and it's a job. It is really a job. Just like the video said, there are thousands of bills that are pending and that would be not only on the federal level but also in the state. So we're you know we have it's it's just terrible. We do have a fight. The last thing that I wanted to mention real quick is that uh, Dinneman, you mentioned Dinneman. Uh, I have found out some things about him. He has this wonderful website, I think. He is a more of a people type of person. And he's a former but professor, college professor. College professor, and so he knows, uh, he knows what's going on with Common Core. But I mentioned him because uh, with all of the uh, questions that have come up from teachers, parents, etc., he called a roundtable discussion. And it's on the web, it's on the, um, yes, it's on his website. It's about two hours long, but I'll tell you really and truly, uh, it almost makes you cry. You're gonna see a totally different picture when you see that uh, video. And I can uh, give you the uh, number. It is all small letters, P as in Peter, A, I, U, net, N, E, T, dot org. And uh, you have, as I, there might be 12 people in this roundtable discussion, and it hits home because one of the uh, people that talk is right here from Warminster, and the things that are ha uh, happening in Centennial, Centennial is one of your uh, lower uh, social economic uh, st uh, standing uh, as far as uh, status, as far as uh, you know, living and everything else. Uh, and I used to work in that area with clients, so I'm familiar with that as well. But that's, I just wanted to bring that out, that Dinneman needs to be looked at. He's, uh, he is doing a job, uh, the way they put it, is that he's taking it piece by piece, and that I don't think there's, that, that deserves criticism, uh, negative criticism, I think it deserves positive, positive criticism, criticism because this is so huge. Thank you. Dinneman, uh, if, if you have time, I would uh, call Dinneman and ask him for his, uh, thank him for his work, because he really has hung in there. It's at least two years, I think, he's been trying to find out things, but he gets stonewalled all the time. And, um, I don't know, but um, the thing I was going to say with um, um, my friend's letter is excellent. She really touches on every aspect of this, and it's very detailed. Um, now I'll let you in on a little secret if you won't tell. I don't know if this is going to work, but whoops, I don't know how I get myself. See, when you're a, a, a committee woman, you know, you get into places you never thought you'd get into. So I wangled this, uh, well, I was going door to door for Corbin. I really didn't want to because I'm not thrilled with him. I did a write-in for him for, in the primary, and uh, oh boy, so I did that. Your, your juicy guy or Bob Gavardi. Yeah, yeah, Bob, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I can't hear his name. And some of my friends, oh, they put in, um, oh, that other guy I like, um, your buddy. No, no. Roar. Yeah, Roar. Lots of people put Roar in. And we said, let's just put some other name and maybe we'll get somebody's attention. But we're not happy. Nothing's done. He's got Republican legislature. He's a Republican. What's the problem? So, uh, I. That's the I called the guy when I was going door to door. A lot of people were, I had three questions. Um, what's your biggest interest in the issues in the state? And a lot of people said education. Um, and I mean, then they said, well, how about all of them? <laughs> okay, you know, whatever. And it was um, one to five. Let's put the number five being the best. And they'd say, well, can I put a zero? Or how about a minus five? And I'd well, sure, put that for answering those questions instead of saying one to five, meaning five is wonderful and one isn't so good, they said, can we put a minus five? What was the question? Well, what's the issue? Or, um, well, that would be education. Um, what was the... Wasn't um, it your opinion of how it, yeah, what was it doing or how... Well, yeah, well... Job performance or hair screening? Job performance probably yeah. like to, and nobody liked it, you know. And I forget the other might have been a medical Obama care type thing in the state. I forget. But uh, anyway, they were trying to get better information to help him. Well, he's 20 points behind the last I looked. And I, I did get a name of this uh, guy who's his political uh, campaign manager. 
So I called him about two weeks ago, and he did call me back, and he did talk quite a long time. Nothing about Common Core. Oh, oh, oh come on. <laughs> so I ended up, uh, I sent an email. We got leadership for liberty. Okay, while she's getting some water, um, Kathy, you had a question? Yeah, I, I, oh, I don't need the microphone. <laughs> I was just wondering, you know, what about kids that excel, like kids that have a very high IQ, who, who are now taking special classes and everything because they're so bright? Where do they fall in Common Core? Yeah, well, that, that's, uh, that hits right at the heart of the problem, and that's what Peg Luxing yeah. last more than a year ago, before, before it really had hit the fan and people were understanding she was saying this is exactly what's going to happen and you know she uh, did illustration she's a teacher and she said you know it's just going to be a matter of when you have to pull when the when the when the whole focus is on everybody meeting this standard you have to focus so much time on these to bring them up that there's really not going to be time to work with these you know and the, that doesn't matter. Yeah. They don't. They don't care. It's you know, much, much easier to control a population yeah. that is poorly educated. That does not would get extra work. That's what happens. Yeah. 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 Well, um, right now I can tell you what's happening in Penridge classrooms is, and I think this was also part of No Child Left Behind. I don't think it's specifically Common Core, but I think Common Core will be even more. You know along this line, but in my my Luke's middle school classroom, they are giving three versions of a test. You have a version that goes to the gifted kids, the bright kids, the middle kids, and the, the lower kids, okay? And then if they don't pass it, the teacher has to go through so many hoops, so much paperwork, group, yeah. meet, group team meetings, consultations with parents, principals, everything like that. I had a veteran teacher say I'm getting out of teaching yeah. sure. because wow. she said it is such a headache that what we do is we make sure that child passes that test. Wow. They, they take tests, they can retest, they can, you know, I had my high school come back the other day and say, Mom, they're giving the same exact test for the retest. What's the point of that? Why should we study for the first one? We can take it the second time around, you know? <laughs> I think it's paper and pencil. It's $10 to $30 range depending on the test. Well, this is, I'm just talking about a, a curriculum test, like an English test or a social studies test or something like that. Yeah, not a standardized. Well, we actually have another topic. I know we could go on and talk about Common Core for quite a while. But yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have, we have um, since we don't have to be out of here on the crack of 9 o'clock, um, Lynn, has, <laughs> yes, Lynn has some very important uh, information on traditional marriage. Um, but, yeah, Carol just wanted you to know that there's a couple of handouts here. This is if you don't have much background, the yellow one. The white one is the same on the front, but there's more information, uh, more detailed information on the back, and they're on the back right hand corner of that. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. Give her a round of applause. I apologize for the, uh, the lateness of, uh, you know, our schedule is a bit off, but I, I hope you all are um, energized to learn more about how we can save traditional marriage. If you'd like to stand up and stretch, please feel free to do so. Um, if you're thirsty, we actually have water and lemonade out there, but we're going to get going with this right away so that we uh, don't keep you uh, much past 9 o'clock. Did that paycheck protection? Yeah, we've got to get it inside. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's 
Oh, okay, I see it. Um, All right, I was see that. I did not see that. I was researching okay. this. Um, okay. I started to come across different different items. I, thought, I just want to put this all kind of in chronological description going back to when... Um, yeah, unless you're not... Just talk right into it. He's working on it. Okay, so what'd you get? You got um, going all the way back to 96 CD with the oh, DOMA. This so I'm not going to hit on all these things. These, This is all for your reference because it's, it's very confusing. I, I talked to patriots that thought that there was a vote by our legislature to pass same-sex marriage, and that's not at all what happened. We have we had legislating legislature by a federally appointed judge, not elected not responsible again yeah, the federal government deciding like what's going to happen in pennsylvania and this is what they've been doing all over the country so if you look at the top of your paper um yeah, they should. We need to shut the door. Everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, it started with a statutory ban in 96, just for a little history. Two or three. For everybody. Um, it was originally introduced as House Bill 2604 by Representative Alan Eagle. And um, it was. There were some problems with it, and I guess the bill was bypassed. Um, it, uh, there was a bid for elections, that sort of thing. Um, and so the actual and the actual DOMA was an amendment that was tacked on to another bill. That's my understanding. Okay, that's my understanding. Um, they debated over EGOLF's amendment. It was an amendment to a bill that uh, was a Pennsylvania Domestic Relations Act for grandparents to adopt grandchildren over the objections of their parents. And this amendment that defined marriage as between one man and one woman was added on to that. Uh, the amendment was debated over and then finally passed and you see what the margins are there. It wasn't, it didn't pass by a small margin, it passed by a resounding margin in both the House and Senate. 177 to 16 in the House, and uh, the Senate, it was 43 to five. And then Governor Ridge passed it into law. So fast forward to 2010, and this is very important. Again, we're talking about Governor Corbett. While seeking election, Corbett, reporting to the Pennsylvania Family Institute, mm -hmm. that he opposed any legislation that would add sexual orientation or gender identity as a protected class in Pennsylvania law. And uh, those of you who are familiar with Pennsylvania Family Institute's voters' guides, does anybody have them in their churches? Or Jerry, yeah, I guess. Few of us are. Um, they post the responses of the candidates. And um, he came up as opposing any sort of legislation. And a lot of us looked at those voters' guides and said, okay, we'll vote for Tom Corbett. <laughs> okay? Pro life, pro family, pro marriage. 
among other the puzzle bit. Okay. Fast forward to um, I, I I learned a lot by looking into this. Fast forward to uh, May of 2011. House Bill 1434 was introduced by Daryl Metcalf in the House. He had 36 sponsors. Um, he has been trying to amend the state constitution to define marriage as being between one man and one woman. The earliest in, uh, incidents of this I could find was 2011. So he's been doing this for quite a while. Okay. Um, there was a delay on this vote, on the voting on this bill. Uh, and I guess it stalled out or something. Um, and uh, the opponents of traditional marriage said, well, we won. Okay. Um, that was in March of 2012. Fast forward to uh, May of 2013. Representative Metcalf again introduces the same bill. So he's been standing for families and traditional values for quite a while. Okay. Uh, this latest lawsuit that we've had to deal with actually uh, was initiated back in July of last year, right? The 9th of July. And uh, just, just follow the chronology of this. This was all filed before Bruce Haynes, Montgomery County Register of Wills, just decided he would issue same-sex marriage licenses. So on the 9th of July, the ACLU, using a uh, volunteer counsel from that law firm that you see there, Hangley, Aronchik, Siegel, Puth, and Schiller, they filed a federal lawsuit in federal court with 23 plaintiffs who were seeking same-sex marriage and the recognition of their marriages out of state. So they had, some of them had gotten married in another state, such as Massachusetts, and wanted to be recognized in Pennsylvania, which had no such recognition of it. Okay. Um, interestingly enough, uh, when, when this was filed, all the parties agreed to have Governor Corbett's name removed from the lawsuit. So they put Wolf on there, and I believe Wolf is the Secretary of Public Health. Mm -hmm. Is he a Democrat? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's a Democrat. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, right. So he was he was listed as a uh, defendant, and also I found it interesting that the Bucks County Register of Wills, Donald Donald Petrilli, was also mentioned, and this was because uh, uh, same sex couples had gone to Montgomery County and then had uh, been well. It started in Mon Montgomery County with uh, Bruce Haynes mm -hmm. on the 24th of July, 2013. He just began to illegally issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples, and in a few weeks' time, he had issued over 160 of these licenses illegally. So at some point after that, people, uh, these individuals came to Bucks County, and uh, some of these people were applying up here. So. It, this has been in the works for a very, very long time. <laughs> and, um, and in between, on the 11th, Kathleen Kane, the Attorney General, said that she is not going to defend the DOMA. Right. It's a statute, not an amendment. And she said, I believe it to be wholly unconstitutional. So just kind of read this. Uh, these are the dates. Um, I'm sorry I didn't have time to supply you with an annotated uh, references, <laughs> but you know this was taken from Wikipedia. Let's see, I wrote down some of the things. Uh, Reuters, Wikipedia, Pennsylvania Family Council, American Family Association, and um, a website called Marriage Matters PA, which is actually a pro-gay, <laughs> a pro-gay 
marriage site, but they provided an excellent chronological order for me. A lot of this I got from their site. It was very valuable. Um, okay, so you see the chronology of this. Um, so now all this damage has been done, and then we have in August of 2013, House Bill 300 was sponsored, introduced into the um, State Government Committee. And uh, on the 12th, uh, Senate Bill 300, their, their companion bills, was introduced into the Pennsylvania State Government, uh, the Senate State Government Committee. And um, I didn't copy it, at, copy it for everybody because of its, <laughs> it would just be, uh, exhausted to try to print it out but Senate Bill 300 goes uh, the, the form that we have today goes back to an act uh, from October 27 1955 which addresses discrimination against certain groups okay when it was written in 1955 they were talking about discriminating against people because of their gender, because of their race, uh, because of disability. It's kind of a civil rights sort of uh, bill. But they have, all, but what they have done now, what they did in August of last year, they um, also inserted sexual orientation and gender identity or expression. Uh, and this, this relates to equal employment, housing, public accommodation. Um, let's see. There's just a lot of different um, sections to this. So they define the term sexual orientation in this bill means the term actual, the, the term sexual orientation means actual or perceived heterosexuality, homosexuality, or bisexuality. The term gender identity or expression means actual or perceived or perceived gender identity, appearance, behavior, expression, or physical characteristics, whether or not associated with an individual's assigned sex of birth. So this was put in place um, in August. And then you see, toward the end of August, all these other lawsuits start to fall in line. You have Palladino versus Corbett. You can read about that there, a uh, little history about it. <coughs> um, then in uh, September, the common well, the Court of Pennsylvania heard the oral arguments regarding the Bruce Haynes case. Remember, there was a big uproar because he was illegally issuing these same-sex marriage licenses. And uh, so that, so oral arguments started on the 4th. On the 13th of September, the trial court rules that Haynes does not have authority to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples. On the 25th, Balin versus Corbett was filed. Um, you can read about the description there. Um, these were the 21 same-sex couples who were issued marriage licenses by Montgomery County Clerk Bruce Haynes. So then they started the lawsuit. Um, and uh, let's see, it, it later was called Balin versus Wolf. So these, these seeds have been planted. This has been, I don't know, are, are, are you tracking with me, seeing how these things have just kind of one after another after another? Okay. It's a plan. That's why when I started to look at this, I said, look at this. Look at this. All right. And here I was thinking, well, we have a Pennsylvania Defense of Marriage Act. We're fine. No, we're not fine because it's a statute not an amendment to our Constitution. Okay, um, there is a mention to a settlement of an estate. <clears throat> you can read, I'm not gonna go into detail about it, it's just more for your background and edification. Um, has to do with uh, paying estate tax and 
uh, to a same sex, you know, a same sex couple survivor. Uh, you know, uh, one of the partners passed away. But on 12, 18, 13, Governor Corbett announces support for sexual orientation policy, as in House Bill 300 and Senate Bill 300. He completely reversed himself. And uh, this was from a Pennsylvania Family Research Council communique. I mean, I get their emails, and they were very, very upset about it. They sent out a whole letter about it. So it, all, it didn't take him very long to completely reverse his position. He's running for okay. office. What's that? He's running for office. He, well, yeah, okay. So personally, he's against it, but yeah, he wasn't going to do anything. Right. So I mean, I just didn't know how much everybody knew about this, how, uh, the history. I mean, I, I actually I actually learned some things doing this research. Um, okay, fast <laughs> fast forward to May of this year, May eighth. Again, Daryl Metcalf steps forward with House Bill thirteen forty nine, and I have it here. It's very short. I, there are copies on the table. And uh, <clears throat> this would introduce a um, amendment to the Pennsylvania Constitution. Marriage is the legal union of only one man and one woman as husband and wife, and no other legal union that is treated as marriage or the substantial equivalent thereof shall be valid or recognized. I don't know. I mean, I, it sounds to me like he just keeps putting this forward. Yeah. You know, um, they get, you don't think so, Sandy? Well, I don't think anything is going to for a long time. Because it's been we can't oh, yeah, well, you're right. That was, right, Thir 1434 was the first bill. Right. Yeah. Um, he's assigned a new number. New printer's number and all that yeah. Yeah. for every session. Every year, yeah. Well, here, here are the co-sponsors for 1349. Uh, in addition to Medcap, Ahmet, Baker, Blue, Causer, Clymer. We thank Paul Clymer for that when we went in and talked to him about comical. <laughs> we thanked him for this. Cutler, Dellinger, B. Gillen, Harris, Hapley, S. Pickerdale, Kaufman, Keller, Knowles, Kriegel, Krieger, Lawrence, Mole, Rapp, Roe, Rock, Sacconi. Sony, Stern, and Tallman. That's it. Those are the co-signers no, right now. Um, okay. Uh, and Simmons actually, huh? Oh, here. After my after my printer ran out of ink last night, I hand copied the um, Pennsylvania State Government Committee. Okay. If you're interested in getting support for this bill, and this is going to be a huge battle, but we should go down without a fight, I don't think. Um, these, this is on the back, back there for you if you want to pick it up. It's the names of all the people, the majority who are Republicans in the State Government Committee. We all need to, those of us that are interested. Um, should urge them to support this. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm almost done with this part. <laughs> um, okay, I already mentioned about primary election today and said how John E. Jones III struck down the will of the people of our state by declaring our Defense of Marriage Act unconstitutional. And I and, and again I have in there what the uh, vote count was when it was passed. Um, he ruled, of course, in favor in favor of the plaintiffs in Whitewood versus Wolf, and he concluded his opinion with this statement: "We are a better people than what these laws represent, and it is time to discard them into the ash heap of history." That's a federal judge who we did not elect, who was appointed just recently. Yes. Okay. By, by Dingy Harry and, uh, okay, I didn't know that either. Well. Okay. It was out in the central she, she, Pennsylvania. She the law for the, the, uh, 
Okay. Okay. So they've all been, you know, this is this has been brewing in the wings for a long time. And uh, when Bob and I went and talked to uh, Representative Clymer, I guess was it a week ago, something like that, not very long ago, we were talking to him about Common Core. Um, there seems to be a lot of naivete about this. You know, we didn't see this coming. Um, I said, what do you mean you didn't see this? I said, you look to the north, look to the south, look to the west. They're all same-sex marriage states. Yeah. We're truly the keystone state. We're, we're, the, we're the gap. <laughs> you know, we've got to plug the hole. And um, he also said, I mean, I just... I just have to tell you, his reaction was, well, Senate Bill 300, that will never get out of committee.